Hi, my name is Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and I'm co-chair of the JOMA Preventative Health Committee. And I'm here today with Dr. Miriam Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman is a board certified dermatologist who specializes in medical and cosmetic dermatology. She received her medical degree, degree and completed her residency training in dermatology at the State University of New York Downstate Medical Center. Dr. Lieberman is committed to quality patient care with a high priority on health education and preventative wellness. And I'm really excited to have you here tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Lieberman. Hi, good evening. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I want to start, I actually want to focus on pediatric dermatology with the subcategory of primarily babies. Um, and really just focus on a few of those topics because we've been talking about how to narrow it down and this is a huge, huge field. I mean, this is the skin, I think, is the biggest organ in the body. Is that correct? Right. And yeah, and so you know, with, with, yeah, there's so much to know about dermatology. Dermatology also includes adult dermatology, pediatric dermatology. Mm -hmm. um, there's surgery, pathology, um, the cosmetics is a whole nother portion of dermatology. You know, skin, hair, nails, we, we do cover a lot. So we can we can make a long long conversation out of this but we're going to do a shorter one so let's start with newborn babies with their Absolutely, perfect, yeah. skin. perfect skin right <laughs> yeah so newborn skin is um unique uh it's a little bit more fragile um less hair on it um there are rashes that appear in newborn skin specifically um you know there's also a lot of considerations Babies wear diapers, um, and uh, there's a lot of things that that parents can see during the newborn age um, that can be concerning to them. Let's talk about bathing the newborn, because that's something I do talk a lot about with new parents. Yeah, definitely. So um, from the very beginning, a, a neonate, a brand newborn, uh, new brand new newborn, um, is uh, potentially going to have two open wounds that, that need to be uh, taken into consideration with bathing. So the first is the umbilical cord um, at the very beginning until that falls off. Um, and the second is if there's a circumcision, um, that's another open wound. So those two um, wounds have to be treated appropriately and taken care of, um, including while bathing. Um, and in those time periods of those uh, wounds, we usually recommend more of a sponge bath, mm -hmm. not a complete submersion into water. So that's very important um, to take into consideration. But um, beyond that time period, uh, newborn bathing um, is, uh, you know, should be a fun time for, for the child. Um, and not every parent knows this, but it doesn't have to be a long time and it shouldn't be a long time. We usually recommend um, for newborn bathing or uh, for infant bathing, and actually even uh, until, you know, 11 years of age, bathing doesn't have to happen every single night. Mm -hmm. um, every other night is certainly sufficient unless uh, a baby or a child is uh, visibly soiled or uh, other concerns about uh, dirt or otherwise. Um, but every, every other night should be sufficient. Um, we recommend that the water be lukewarm not too hot, um, and that the time in the bath should be limited to somewhere closer to five to 10 minutes. You know, some, some kids can really enjoy the bath, and we actually recommend that they, we limit the time, especially in children who, who suffer from eczema, um, atopic dermatitis, which we'll, I think we definitely want to be discussing later. But um, Absolutely. so lukewarm water, yeah, limiting the time that's in the, that the child spends in the bath, um, and then importantly, when the bath is over, you want to um, pat them dry and not rub them dry. You don't want to use any kind of harsh um, loofah in the bath either. You know, rubbing and scrubbing the skin of a baby, a child, even adults, is not actually good for the skin, um, and it is something that we don't uh, we don't recommend. Um, pat, so patting dry is good. Moisturizing after bathing is good. Um, you can leave the skin actually a little bit wet and that kind of locks in the moisture um, with a good moisturizer. We usually recommend creams and ointments depending on the time of year. Mm -hmm. Lotions and gels are actually more drying um, when used as moisturizers. And so 
we, we recommend creams and, um, and ointments. Um, ointments less so in the summer because it's hot um, and creams more so in the summer, ointments in the winter. Um, and as far as moisturizer type, main recommendations are to avoid things with fragrance, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. um, things like CeraVe, you know, don't want to name drop, but uh, right. the well-known Dove sensitive skin without fragrance. Um, there's a lot of options. Those aren't the only ones, um, but you want to, you know, eliminate fragrance and any kind of essential oils and, and things like that. Are you talking about ointments and creams or are you talking about soap? All three, everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even soap should be very, very mild. Yeah, absolutely. And really use as little as possible, right? Right. So, you know, you don't even have to be cleaning the entire body. Mm -hmm. um, certainly areas that appear soiled, um, but concentrating on areas like the underarms, the groin, the scalp, of course, um, those are sufficient for bathing. So let's talk about some of the rashes that babies get. I mentioned diapers, we should certainly get into mm -hmm. diaper rash, but even even before then, just maybe go through a little bit on the the rashes that babies get in the very beginning that really are harmless and go away in their own. Yeah, so um, the baby rashes that we see usually within the first um, four weeks, mm -hmm. a lot of them are transient, meaning they're temporary, they, they self-resolve. Um, certainly, if there's anything that's uh, sticking around for longer than what you would expect or, or if there's any concern, definitely, you know, see the pediatrician, see a dermatologist. Um, you know, things that can appear like acne, things that appear like uh, dandruff, for example, uh, what we call seborrheic dermatitis or more commonly known as cradle cap. It can appear on the scalp. Yeah, cradle cap. It can appear on the scalp, but it can also appear on the body um, of, of babies. And um, that usually peaks at about three months time. Um, there's also overlap with, uh, with uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema that you can see with the seborrheic dermatitis. Um, there's, how could you uh, tell those, I mean to judge, yeah. how can you tell those two apart? So the distribution is usually different. Mm -hmm. um, the timing is a little different. And um, just the appearance of the rash itself differs. So that's something that, you know, you're going to want to see a doctor for so that they can help make that distinction and then guide you appropriately with, with the treatment because the treatments do differ um, between seborrheic dermatitis and uh, atopic dermatitis. Could Sometimes we have to treat both mm -hmm. at the same time. So mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard them described as seb eczema because they overlap so much. Yeah, exactly. So how would you treat one versus the other and say a three-month-old? Right, so seborrheic dermatitis is usually uh, yeast-based, and so we're going to try to treat it with um, an antifungal, which targets the yeast as well. And then the eczema, or atopic dermatitis, that, that we um, usually refer to it as, is usually going to be based on bathing habits, moisturization, um, topical steroids when needed. You know, it depends how severe it is. It depends what's, what's needed in... in uh, in which location it is, et cetera, but um, they do have uh, different treatment, different approaches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's start with diaper rashes. Yeah, sure. So can be very rashes, persistent. Yeah, <laughs> they can be very persistent and um, they can be very troubling for parents for sure. Um, I've lost count of how many diapers I've changed for my, for my own children, um, sometimes in the same day. Uh, so it's definitely a frequent uh, occurrence, dirty diapers and uh, seeing diaper rashes. So the best uh, approach is to try to prevent them from occurring. Mm -hmm. um, so number one is change the diapers as soon as possible, uh, both to prevent the rash, but also to save your laundry load sometimes. Um, so changing those diapers as soon as possible is definitely number one. You know, the moisture mm -hmm. and the acidity of, uh, of the 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 bowel movements and and the urine those can all uh, irritate the skin or, or inflame a rash that's already there if there is one um, the next step would be to clean the area gently so um, there are a lot of baby wipes out there some of them are better than the others um, 
the ideal would just be water and a soft washcloth. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit difficult for people, especially, you know, when you're on the go. Um, there is a product called Water Wipes that really limits the um, amount of chemicals and additives that are in it and irritants. Um, I personally do like that. I use it. Um, it's um, very uh, safe and, and uh, it's actually has an expiration date because it's not a, it doesn't have enough chemicals to keep it, yeah, enough of a preservative. Um, so, you know, clean the area gently, water, soft washcloth. You want to let the area dry, air dry ideally, before you put on a diaper again um, because you're just locking in that moisture and creating more um, more potential for a, uh, a rash. Um, it's good to have handy um, a zinc oxide diaper cream something like desitin, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're seeing red between those changes, um, that's a sign that the, you know, you need to be applying something like a zinc oxide. Um, if the, if it's getting worse than just looking red, um, layered on like you're, you're, you know, almost like we say, like you're frosting a cake. You don't have to remove that cream right. in between each diaper change. You can leave it. Um, and at the end of the day, try to try to clean it up a little bit better. Um, Certainly, you know, if there's any concern for a skin infection or, you know, some babies do have very delicate skin or, or they're getting very irritated from, from their diapers um, and the rash is not getting better, then that's the time to speak to your pediatrician, speak to your dermatologist. Mm -hmm. So you can also have a yeast infection on top of a regular rash and that can often be hard to treat. Just wanted you to give a little bit of advice when it gets, how would you know that there's a yeast infection and what could we do to get rid of it? Yeah, so um, the diaper rashes from the, uh, you know, from the bowel movements and from the urine, those are more of an irritant contact dermatitis. So mm -hmm. the something's irritating the skin, but there's lots of other rashes that in a can occur in the diaper area, including yeast. It can be, um, you know, psoriasis is another rash that can occur in that area. We don't usually see eczema or atopic dermatitis in the diaper area just because it's so well kept moist um, that uh, it doesn't tend to form there. Um, but there's certainly other rashes that can be concerning. So I think the number one key is if it doesn't look like your regular diaper rash and you're feeling concerned, it's time to to point it out to a doctor to, to get some help. But, you know, you, following those steps of changing dirty diapers as soon as possible, being gentle, applying the zinc oxide um, to prevent any other kind of irritant diaper rash, that's definitely the, the first approach. Right, because what I find is that it starts out like a regular diaper rash. The skin is irritated mm -hmm. and it's moist there and yeast starts growing. So you start it with a regular rash and then it becomes a yeast diaper rash. And then the question is, um, can you, and I'm doing this more from a medical, you know, a doctor's perspective at this point, right? Um, yeah. Everybody who has a child with a rash is not going to be getting medical advice from this podcast. They're going to go to their doctor. Right. Um, but I do want to talk about it because it's a common scenario. So a child gets a yeast rash and they're using the antifungal, um, but it's still very, very raw and painful. Do you use a topical steroid at that point? The reason I'm asking is there used to be a medication that combined the two and the advice, you know, to right. doctors has been don't use it. I, I don't use it. I'm just curious what right. you do. So we tend to not use the two combined. Mm -hmm. um, we'll tend to, you know, if something's very inflamed from uh, seborrheic dermatitis um, or it's very uncomfortable, um, you can use a steroid to calm down that inflammation initially. Um, but the mainstay of the treatment is going to be um, with uh, an antifungal, both as a, a wash or as a cream. And, um, and time also improves, um, pr improves it in, in these newborn babies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's talk about eczema. Because that's really, <laughs> I think, what pediatricians spend the most time of all the rashes is the eczema rashes or atopic dermatitis. Right. Right. So yeah, so atopic dermatitis, so, you know, a lot of people call it eczema. Um, atopic dermatitis is just a little bit more uh, specific, but it's a very common skin condition in babies. Um, about one fourth of children are affected, um, especially 
uh, during the first year of life. Um, there's no cure for it, uh, unfortunately. Um, it can be well controlled with uh, a lot of skincare, um, including like what I was mentioning, moisturizers, prescription medications, including steroids. Um, and then, you know, if there are, are any triggers for it, eliminating those triggers. Um, it has a, it is thought to potentially be genetic. You know, it's been shown that uh, mothers and fathers, either or, mm -hmm. um, who have a history of atopic dermatitis are more likely to have a child with uh, atopic dermatitis. But that's not to say that, you know, somebody has to have parental history in order to, to have it. Um, it can go both ways. Wait, when you um, say it's not curable, it, this does not necessarily last for life. That's true also, yeah, so that's the next point. Um, mm -hmm. In the majority of cases, um, children who have atopic dermatitis, it usually does improve over time and um, there won't, they won't be uh, affected by it in their adulthood. But there are cases, there are situations where um, a child with atopic dermatitis will continue to have it um, through adulthood. Are there ways to prevent or make it less severe early on, say if you know there's a genetic risk? Yeah, absolutely. So if there's a known genetic risk um, of either atopic dermatitis itself or even in families that, you know, a lot of allergies mm -hmm. or asthma tend to run, those are, the, that's the atopic, what we call the atopic triad, right. just three things mm -hmm. that tend to go together or the atopic march, yep. Um, so in those families, you definitely want to, from a very young age, start with all the um, gentle skincare approach with the with the specialized bathing that we discussed and moisturizers to kind of be ahead of the game and um, prevent uh, any kind of rash from worsening. And it's interesting because the advice we have given in the past with um, skin peeling in newborns, which we didn't really talk about, but is you know universal to have some degree of peeling skin yeah. is to leave it alone. Um, and I'm reading that mm -hmm. it may be that in the high-risk babies, those with a strong family history or siblings, you know, with bad eczema, that you may want to actually moisturize even in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. So people with the family history, you want to start it young. And, mm -hmm. and that can be after every time you bathe a, a child to moisturize, get into the habit, you know. Um, and when they, the kids get the child gets a little bit older, you know, involve them. It can be fun for them and it doesn't have to be scary and upsetting. They can help you uh, put on the moisturizer and hopefully uh, not try to eat it sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, we talked before about bathing and we said, you know, we really don't want them in the water for too long if they're prone to eczema, but the frequency of bathing is a question that does come up with my patients with, with eczema. A lot of the parents believe yeah. they can't wait bathe them that often or it's going to make the eczema worse. Yeah, so, you know, it's funny, um, it's, it's been studied a lot, the frequency of bathing. Um, the general approach is that not to overbathe, definitely, both in time and in frequency. Um, however, in children with atopic dermatitis, um, if you're putting them in the bath appropriately, short, lukewarm, um, like we were discussing, and not scrubbing and, and rubbing and moisturizing them after, Mm -hmm. um, then that would be okay um, to do a daily bath. Um, you know, there is actually one treatment approach for um, atopic dermatitis called bleach baths, where mm -hmm. you actually dilute bleach into a bathtub um, as a treatment approach. Um, kids with atopic dermatitis tend to get colonized with bacteria. Mm -hmm. And the thought is, um, and this is still active research, things fluctuate, but the thought is that the colonization of the skin with bacteria makes the atopic dermatitis worse. And so getting rid of some of that um, skin uh, bacteria can potentially improve the atopic dermatitis. So we sometimes even use bathing as a treatment, um, as bleach baths. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, definitely ask your doctor before doing that. Yes, always include a doctor in that approach. Very good. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about eczema in terms of the treatment. And really what I want to focus on is the topical steroids, because that's something I also hear a lot of parents who are trying so hard to avoid the steroids, they are scared of them um, and the side effects that, that they perceive. 
Yeah, so um, it's understandable to be uh, worried about steroids. You know, we hear sometimes in, in the news about steroids and all these side effects. Um, steroids come in different forms. They can be taken by mouth, they can be taken through IV, and they can be placed topically. The steroids that we're talking about um, to start with are the topical corticosteroids um, to treat eczema. Um, that medication helps to decrease inflammation. It helps to control symptoms like itching. Um, they can come in a lot of forms, ointments, creams, sprays, lotions. Um, you know, the topical medications in general do get absorbed through the skin, but when used appropriately and as directed by a physician, um, it is possible to avoid uh, potential side effects that can occur. Um, and it is safe to use, and it's important to use. Um, treating your child's eczema or atopic dermatitis quickly before it worsens um, will make it uh, easier to treat. You know, once mm -hmm. the condition worsens, it's even more difficult to treat, um, and it creates more problems like uh, a skin infection mm -hmm. that you know add on more medications that are needed to treat. You know, as the skin breaks down. The skin is our barrier to the outside world. So when the skin breaks down, it makes it easier for bacteria and viruses, other germs to just get inside the body. Um, and so it's really, it's not just a cosmetic thing or an appearance thing to treat eczema. It truly is um, important from a medical standpoint to get eczema or atopic dermatitis uh, under control, um, you know, comfort wise for, ba for babies or children. Um, but also to help prevent these other secondary, what we call secondary infections. And it is really, really itchy. I've heard um, eczema being described as the itch that rashes, that yeah. the itch and then the scratch to break that cycle, it may not just be topical, it may also be a medication by mouth, like right. an antihistamine. So it, mm -hmm. Yeah, so antihistamines are, are used uh, very commonly in atopic dermatitis as well. Um, more from the standpoint of, of sometimes helping through the night, mm -hmm. um, with helping uh, children sleep through the night. Um, very often nighttime is when we feel our puritis, our itch, kick up mm -hmm. a notch, uh, whether it's because, you know, that's the time where our mind starts to rest and we start to notice uh, uh, these sensations more. Um, but uh, that's where the antihistamines generally come into play. It's not clear yet through research if it truly helps with the itching sensation, but it but it is very commonly utilized and um, will continue to be used. Um, and there are other medications I should mention that are being studied um, more for severe atopic dermatitis mm -hmm. that can't be controlled um, topically and with antihistamines, um, but there are definitely a lot of things being studied that things that have already been approved um, that are exciting for, for uh, patients who do suffer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One what other thing actually that we didn't mention, um, you know, triggers are important to uh, take note of. It's sometimes hard to identify those triggers, but mm. you know, things like saliva, sweat, like you just mm -hmm. mentioned, scratching. Um, there's a lot of environmental triggers, smoking in the home, um, if the air is too dry, having a pet, pet dander, pollen, um, these are all things that can trigger atopic dermatitis. There's also, um, you know, product triggers like uh, certain clothing, laundry detergents, um, fabric softeners, and then like we were mentioning before, the shampoos and soaps, mm -hmm. um, baby powders, baby wipes, all the things that we're just, you know, continuously um, being surrounded with. So those are all things that can trigger atopic dermatitis. And if you're noticing that that's what's happening, um, it's really important to try to prevent, eliminate um, um, all of those things. Which moisturizer do you like to recommend? So I like to recommend the one that I like to use actually. Um, so I prefer as, a, you know, like I was saying, cream and ointment, it's mm -hmm. good to have both available. Um, depending on, on what you're seeing and depending on the time of the year. I like plain Vaseline, mm -hmm. um, just plain petrolatum um, Vaseline. Uh, Aquaphor, a lot of people like. Aquaphor has one other component in it called lanolin. Mm -hmm. It's actually made, it comes from sheep's wool. Um, it's very moisturizing, but uh, some people are 
actually allergic to it. So I like to just take out that um, concern or consideration and just stick with uh, Vaseline. So Vaseline's my go-to, especially in the winter time. Um, and the other one that I like a lot is uh, CeraVe mm -hmm. um, or CeraVe uh, cream. Mm -hmm. Yep, those are really good ones. And, and I actually just read about kids who have eczema may be more likely to become allergic to the lanolin because their skin is so broken down. So that, that's good to know about the Aquaphor. Yeah, so, be, so be um, absolutely. So yeah, um, the skin breakdown, the opening of the skin um, creates a, um, you know, uh, increased uh, risk of having this uh, concept, this uh, allergic contact dermatitis risk. Um, and so like, like you're just saying, lanolin is one of the um, products that can cause um, an allergic contact dermatitis um, and create an allergy in kids who are already at risk of that. So for me, it just uh, makes sense to avoid that, take it off the consideration from the beginning. Right, absolutely. And also as a parent, if you notice that you're using something and it says hypoallergenic, but your child is seeming to react to it, don't assume that hypoallergenic means your child can't have a reaction. There are so many chemicals that manage to um, still be allowed under the label hypoallergenic that your child may be sensitive to. So especially if yeah, your child- Yeah, that's really having, important. Yeah, having bad eczema, really they, may be, mm -hmm, they may be more likely to be sensitive to it. So that's, that's really important to know. And speaking of allergies, um, parents do ask, my child has bad eczema, do you think they have food allergies? Could it be foods that trigger this? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because that's um, something that, you know, gets asked a lot. It gets mentioned a lot in the media um, and it's a big discussion for parents. So foods don't cause atopic dermatitis. Um, we don't know everything about atopic dermatitis, but we do know that um, it's a skin barrier malfunction, whether it's a combination of genetic or otherwise. Um, that's not to say, though, that uh, food allergies don't make atopic dermatitis worse. So although foods don't cause atopic dermatitis, food, certain foods and food allergies can make it worse. Um, you know, that's definitely something to keep in mind if you have a child who suffers, suffers from atopic dermatitis and to notice um, if something's making, uh, if something that they're eating seems to make uh, their rash or their skin worsen. And um, it's something to, to potentially test for if needed. Um, it's actually really interesting because there's more and more data coming out. Um, there was a recent study out of Japan um, showing the reverse, that uncontrolled atopic dermatitis mm -hmm. can actually increase a child's risk of having a food allergy. And the thought process for that is that, um, you know, the food, food allergens enter through that open skin mm -hmm. and creates the allergy in the child um, because of the early exposure to it. And so that goes back to what I was discussing, the importance of really treating early and treating well um, and, and really, you know, using the topical steroids as directed to get atopic dermatitis under control um, because there is this potential, this new study, these new studies that are coming out showing that having well-controlled eczema may actually lead to fewer food allergies um, wow. later on. And I do believe That's that- kind of turning it, turning it on its head. Right, and I do believe that, you know, we're also trying to decrease food allergies by not waiting too long, that they can actually become more likely to have allergies if they wait too long, but the exception would be a child who would be at higher risk. Um, and that would be either a child who's already, we know has an egg allergy, um, I'm actually, I'm talking about peanut allergy testing. I'm confusing two topics, I'm sorry. Um, in terms of children, because people have asked me, should my child be tested for peanut allergy? And one category where they should be is children with quite severe eczema, right, higher risk. And without just starting them on it, yeah. they, they should be tested. Not everybody should be tested. Yeah, so that, no, right, that's an important, yeah. So that's very important because um, part of the the, concept of what you're discussing is, you know, you don't want to eliminate foods in your mm -hmm. child that they are not allergic to because that actually increases the risk of them developing an allergy. Um, so 
Uh, definitely, if you think something's worsening atopic dermatitis, you want to bring it up with a physician mm -hmm. um, before you just stop feeding your child any foods. But a true allergic reaction, of course, needs uh, immediate attention and, and uh, elimination potentially from the diet. Um, and then what you were mentioning uh, otherwise, that if a child does have a family history of of peanut allergy, there's usually uh, there is usually an indication to test that child before introducing peanuts or um, introducing it under a more observed setting. Actually, um, so actually, I think that they changed that. that. I think they actually changed the guidelines to not a family history of peanut allergies, but either the child themselves mm -hmm. has an egg allergy or the child himself has um, bad eczema. In those yes, cases, that's you, also would, true. you would test. You would test. Yeah. For peanut allergy before offering it, you would test early. Yeah. Because exactly. early introduction actually in a child who might be at more risk would lower the chance of him getting it later. But I do want to say something about allergy testing. 100%. There's two kinds of yeah. allergy testing there's skin testing and there's blood testing. And there's a misconception that they are so, they're so accurate. <laughs> there's not, there's a very, right. very high false positive both for skin and for blood testing. And I have one patient who the pediatrician didn't send to an allergist and just, you know, the child had some atopic features and they did a whole series of blood tests and the child was positive for pretty much everything. And this child's been living on mm -hmm. a severely restricted diet. And like I said, there's maybe as much as a 50% false positive rate that he, he may not be allergic to many of these foods and his diet is being restricted. Yeah. So you don't want to go the other end and just say, okay, the child has some eczema, we're going to do have the pediatrician do a whole panel of, of these allergy testings because too much can also, too much testing can also be problematic. Yeah, I think it's really important to get um, a good focused care for allergy because there's a lot of unknown in that field as far as mm -hmm. um, the testing and what testing means and, and what should be tested. You know. Um, Mo the right approach would not be to eliminate foods just based on testing only. Um, you really have to work together with an allergist um, to figure out how, how to approach, um, you know, the diet in, in somebody who you, you have concern for allergies. Um, you know, there's, there's other options of doing uh, observed exposure to foods, um, like you mentioned, the overall the overall uh, goal is to get the foods into the diet early and not, not to prevent right. foods that a child's not allergic to and keeping that out of the diet and creating an allergy that they otherwise would not have had. Right. This has been so informative. I really appreciate this. I just want to give one, have let you give one quick plug for sunscreen because it's summer. <laughs> And we're kind of trying always, to focus always. more on prevention. So I just want to help let you give one quick plug for sunscreen. Definitely. I, I will plug sunscreen summer through winter. So mm -hmm. um, I'll discuss sunscreen for, for babies because I think that's kind of been the focus of our talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely, um, you know, it's not just about sunscreen. It's also sun safety. That's what I like to, to mm -hmm. tell parents and, and people in general. You want to try to keep a baby, especially under six months, in the shade. That's the best way to keep them mm -hmm. out of the sun. Um, you know, under six months, you can create shade with an umbrella, a canopy, a stroller. Um, the other thing to create shade or sun protection is in sun protective clothing, mm -hmm. long sleeve shirts, pants, um, a wide brimmed hat, sunglasses with UV protection. Um, there's also these sun blankets for, for little ones while they're napping if you need. Um, under six months, we try to minimize the sunscreen use, but I wouldn't say that you absolutely cannot use sunscreen in children younger than six months. That used to be the approach. Um, you just really want to minimize it. And more importantly, you want to pick the right sunscreen for a baby. So uh, you want to look for a mineral or physical sunscreen, sunscreens that contain um, titanium dioxide or zinc oxide, mm -hmm. those are less likely to irritate a uh, baby's uh, skin. They have sensitive skin. Um, and so you want to look for that kind of sunscreen um, that says uh, it's broad spectrum, water resistant, SPF of at least 30. That's what you want to be applying to your child's skin. And you want to do it before you go out, about 15 minutes before going out. And every two hours, um, if you're out for longer than that time period, and definitely after swimming or s excessive sweating, because 
there's no such thing as a waterproof sunscreen, even though um, people, you know, like to, or companies like to advertise right. that. And staying safe, you know, if you notice that your child is getting overheated, is not drinking enough, they're getting fussy or crying, they're very red on their skin, you want to take them inside, cool them off, make sure that they stay safe. Right. Well, that's all really good advice. And I thank you so much for joining me. And I hope that we can get together again and talk about so many other topics we didn't have a chance to cover today. I would enjoy that very much. Thank you for having me. It's been a great opportunity to speak. Thank you. Good night.